Howdy, welcome to Elementary Statistics. I am Lance Curtis, and this is the lecture for Section 1-1, Statistical and Critical Thinking. Let's dive in. Here we're going to see an overview of what we're going to talk about in this lecture. First, we'll go into some vocabulary to establish the foundation, and then we'll look at the statistical study process, some potential pitfalls that we might find along the way and then finally we'll end by making sure that we understand how to calculate percentages. Let's go. To start with we need to understand some vocabulary words and the first we're going to start with is statistics. Statistics is the science of planning studies and experiments, obtaining data and then organizing, summarizing, presenting, analyzing, interpreting, and drawing conclusions based on the data. Yada, 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 yada. It's a lot of words for basically saying, look, what we do with statistics is we take data and we use that data to make conclusions. That's basically statistics in a nutshell. Data are collections of observations, such as measurements, categories, or survey responses. So this is these are the, the measurements, the information that we're going to collect in order to make our conclusions. Now, the conclusions can be about different groups, and the first type of group that we need to understand is a population. When we talk about a population, we're talking about the complete collection of all measurements of data and consideration. So, population is basically the entire group. Okay, A census would be collecting data from every member of a population. So, if we're going to collect data from every member of a group, then that would comprise a census. However, censuses are very few and far between because they are costly, both in terms of time, in terms of financial resources, and in terms of power. By power, I mean manpower. So very often what we take is not a census, but rather a sample. So we're going to take information from a portion of the population and then use that information that we collect from the sample to help us make conclusions about the entire population, even though we didn't take information from every member of the population. How does that work? Well, let's look at an example. The Gallup Corporation once collected data from 1,013 adults in the United States. And the results from that data collection showed that 66% of the respondents worried about identity theft. So what we see here is the population consisting of all the adults in the United States, you know, all nearly 250 million of them. This is the population. Okay, so we look at the entire country, every adult that lives inside the United States, that's the population. However, what we surveyed was not the population. We didn't ask questions of all almost 250 million people. We asked questions of only 1,013 adults. So that comprises a sample. That portion of the population that we actually queried is a sample. So, you know, we picked uh, people from different locations across the country uh, in order for their <clears throat> survey to have any sort of validity there's got to be some randomization to how you select who who is going to participate in the survey and with that randomization then we have a sample that is characteristic of the entire population and that's the key you take a smaller portion of the population that has the same characteristics as the whole population and that allows you to take the data that you extract from that sample to make conclusions about the entire population. And this is our objective in statistics. We don't want to have to query every member of a population in order to collect the data we need for our analysis. We only want to collect a small portion because it is much cheaper, it is much faster, and it requires far fewer manpower. So the key concepts that we're going to look at in this lecture are an overview of the process involved in conducting a statistical study. Now, 
All statistical studies involve three main steps, which you see here. The first step is to prepare the study. The second is to analyze, so you're actually collecting the data and performing an analysis. And then that analysis will produce results, which then leads to the last step, which is making conclusions. So let's look at each of these in, in turn. The first step is to prepare. So part of the preparation is examining context. Okay, What kind of data are we going to collect? And what does that data actually mean? Okay, What is the goal of the study? What is it that we're trying to accomplish? Usually there's some question that's driving the investigation. What is that question? What question are we looking to answer? We need to know that up front. We also need to consider what sources are we going to use for our data? Okay, obviously we want to reduce bias as much as possible. So it's good to ask the question, you know, how objective are the sources of our data? We need to be very vigilant and skeptical of studies uh, from potentially biased sources. We need to look at our sampling method. Okay, as I was saying just a moment ago, what allows us to make conclusions about the whole population without taking data from every member of the population is that the sample we take is very is very much this has the same characteristics as the entire population so with that in play we can actually make conclusions for the whole population even though we didn't collect data from the whole population well that begs the question how do we get that sample to have those same characteristics and the answer is we have to look to our sampling method. Does the method that we use for taking our sample influence the validity of the conclusion? And the answer is yes, it will, especially if the, the way we take a sample produces a sample that has characteristics very different from that of the entire population. On this note, voluntary response samples often have bias. So voluntary response means people decide whether or not they're going to participate themselves. We see this type of sampling done all the time with online surveys. So you're going to visit a website. You've probably seen a little pop-up window come up and say, hey, please participate in our survey. We're very interested in your feedback. That's voluntary response. And that type of sampling method often has bias. So it, it just boggles my mind. It's like, why are all these people using a sampling method that's obviously very biased. Well, they must not know very much about statistics. And this is one of the reasons why statistics should be one of those required classes that everybody takes, because there's a lot of critical thinking skills that we use in statistics that can be adequately applied across the board. Let's look at the next step, which is analyze. So the main thing we want to do with analysis uh, is collect that data and then put it in a format so that we can actually get characteristics of the sample out from the data. We want to put the data in a form that it can speak to us, that we can understand what it's trying to tell us. And one of the best ways to do that is to use an appropriate graph. There are tons of different graphing options that you can choose from, and we're going to talk about those options in this course later in Chapter 2. But one of the first things we do when we get our data is we're going to make some type of visual representation with it to help us analyze the data so we can get those characteristics out and hear what the data has to tell us. We also apply statistical methods to the data. Okay, So the old school approach, which is what I was trained in when I went to college, requires strong computational skills. Okay, But bless your little hearts, you're living in the 21st century. So today you have technology readily available to you that does a lot of that number crunching for you. Okay, Notwithstanding, all the, all the software is going to produce is some number. Okay, You still need to have common sense and good judgment that's founded in an understanding of sound statistical methods in order to interpret that number correctly and apply it to whatever real world situation you're dealing with. So again, statistics is a course in critical thinking skills as much as it is a math course. 
Once we get those results from our analysis, we're ready to make conclusions. And what we look for when making conclusions is what's called statistical significance. So what that means is when you say that a study has statistical significance or the result from a study has statistical significance, what you're saying is that this result that we're getting is very unlikely to occur by random chance alone. So it's not by happenstance that we got this result. It's not like you just say, well, you roll the die and you happen to roll a four. Well, okay, then that's, that's, you could get that by random chance. If you can get it by ran, random chance, then the results that you have do not have statistical significance. What you want is to have your results, to have statistical significance, so that you can say, look, there's some actual meaning here. It's not just happenstance that we got this result. And as always, when you're forming your conclusions, you want to make sure that you stake the practical implications of the results. Very often, those who perform any type of statistical analysis are doing it for the benefit of a decision maker, someone who needs to make a decision on a course of action to be taken then very often those people are not uh, fluent in the methodology of statistics. So when you start talking all of this, you know, statistic ease, the special language that we have, and there's a whole lot of vocabulary that we'll get into as you get through the course. Well, that's like a foreign language to a lot of people. It's just going to go right over their head. So you've always got to state the results of your analysis in, in ways that, people who aren't versed in statistical methodology will be able to understand. Here's an example of a statistical study, and it exemplifies the need for common sense when looking at your results. Okay, So the example we have here is a test of the Atkins Weight Loss Program. We have 40 subjects. Didn't you love that? It's like they're not people, they're subjects. Okay, kind of love that. 40 subjects have a mean weight loss of 4.6 pounds after one year, okay? So mean is the statistical word for average. And I'll just bring that up in case you didn't know it. So you've got 40 people here, the average weight loss, 4.6 pounds after one year, okay? So using the formal methods of statistical analysis, okay, we can make the conclusion that this amount of weight loss is statistically significant. It didn't just happen by chance, okay? There's something actually driving that weight loss of 4.6 pounds after one year, okay? So we can say that, okay, yeah, okay, this is actually working. There actually is weight being lost on this program, okay? But statistical significance is not necessarily the same as practical significance. Okay, I mean, I don't know about you, but 4.6 pounds in one year, I mean, that's pathetic. I mean, who would want to sign up for that program? You know, I mean, I could lose 4.6 pounds of water weight in a week, okay, just by, just by approaching it the right way. So, you know, people would look at that and say, it's not a very effective diet. It's not really working. But the statistics actually say, yes. It is working some, it, there's there's something working here. There's something driving that weight loss. It doesn't say what it is, okay? You've got to do something more in order to get that answer to that question. But the analysis is showing you that the, that the weight is being lost. It is statistically significant, but that does not necessarily mean that it's practically significant. And so you always want to just blindly follow the statistical studies that you do. The results that you get out may be statistically significant, but that doesn't mean they're practically significant. You want to use good judgment to try to ferret out, okay, what is it that's actually going to be worth pursuing? This leads us to some potential pitfalls that we have along the way when conducting statistical analyses. And very often, in, in the mind of the general public, people fall for all sorts of things uh, statistics, statistically speaking, and you know, part of the part of the way that you get good judgment when looking at statistical uh, studies is to say, okay, you know what, we need to recognize what the pitfalls are so we can avoid them. One of the pitfalls that we that we invariably counter is with misleading conclusions. Okay, and a very common 
a very common approach that's taken is to look and say, okay, we've got two variables, they're existing together, and look, the statistical study shows that there's a strong correlation between those two variables. Well, just because two things happen at the same time doesn't mean they're related. And yet, because of that strong correlation which the statistical study cites, people were rushed to, to the wrong conclusion of, well, one of these must be causing the other. And that's not necessarily the case. Correlation does not imply causality. All correlation says is that there's some, there's some relationship existing here. And oftentimes, that relationship may not necessarily be directly one to the other. They may, may both may be related to a third variable that's outside the realm of the data that you collected. For example, if you were to take a study of smoking and pulse rays, okay, you might find there's some correlation there, but that doesn't mean that, you know, one causes the other. It's not like if, you know, people who smoke have higher or lower pulse rates than people who don't smoke. The classic example of this principle, and you see this on the graph here, is the correlation existing between the number of elementary school teachers in a given town versus the number of bars in the same town. So as you can see here with the red line, which is our line of best fit, uh, running through the blue uh, points there on the graph, and those blue points are the actual data points that we collected in the study. The line of best fit is really showing a strong correlation between our two variables. And yet, if we follow the conclusion that's coming out of this, we could easily jump to the wrong conclusion and said, well, if we need more elementary school teachers, we got to build more bars. And that's completely ridiculous. Okay? There's, there's, there's just, it's not like one of these is causing the other. Okay, What's really going on here is you have to look at a third variable. Why would you see an increase in elementary school teachers at the same time as you see an increase in the number of bars in town? And the answer is because the town is growing. The more people that move in, the more families you have, the more children you need to put in school, the more teachers you need to have to teach those children. But also on, this, on, the, on, the, on the flip side, the more growth you have, the more services you need, and you know some of the services that get requested are more places to go go drinking so you've got to look at third variables that aren't necessarily in your study that aren't necessarily in your data points but that are related to each of your variables the correlation exists between these two apparently unrelated variables because growth is related to both of those variables so don't just jump to the conclusion and say oh well i've got a strong correlation that must mean one causes the other no, that's, that's not the case at all. Sometimes it is, but oftentimes it isn't. Another pitfall that people commonly fall into is the use of small samples. You never want to base your conclusions on sample sizes which are too small. Okay, So for example, if you're doing a study that involves looking at the suspension rate of a school, you'd want a sample size bigger than three students. Okay, there's no way that that sample of three students is going to have the characteristics that are representative enough of the entire school population. So, again, if you want to make conclusions about a population based on data you get from a sample, that sample needs to have roughly the same characteristics as the entire population in order for those conclusions to be valid. And to do that, you've got to make sure you take a sufficiently high sample size. Missing data. Oh my gosh, this is like a huge pitfall that lots of people come into. And really, you have to understand, okay, I've actually made enough statistical models in my day that I can tell you for fact, you can make a model that tells you anything you want to hear. And there's nothing to say that you know, if you want to have a, a model that's going to support a predetermined conclusion that advances a certain agenda, all you have to do is cherry pick the data so that you get the, the, the result you want from the model and then can therefore support your predetermined conclusion and advance your agenda. Really, I mean, that, that, that's all you have to do.
Okay, so th that the existence of missing data when you're not when you don't have all the data that you need to make the model that you really need to be making that could be a huge problem because not having that data produces an analysis that leads to a different conclusion than perhaps the one you should be going on. Missing data dramatically affects results. I can't tell you uh, how many meetings I was in where we were talking about well, what are we going to do now that we're missing data from you know these parts of the world. Some of the models that I've made professionally uh, about the operation of natural gas turbine units for the power generation industry. I mean, there's some there's some instances in which it was almost impossible to get data out. And you, you could you could get data from some units, but usually the data you're, you're wanting is coming from somebody who's there on site. And oftentimes they're not willing to give you the data that you need. And that could be for a multitude of reasons. Okay, for example, it was very difficult for us to get data out of units that were based in Japan because the Japanese have a certain culture uh, surrounding uh, the role of failure uh, in their lifestyle. So failure in the Japanese perspective is looked on as very bad. And so whenever we would ask for data about the failure of their electrical producing units, they would... Uh, it would be like, <laughs> it's like herding cats. It's just so hard to do because you're fighting this cultural notion of what failure is to them. And you're asking them to accept failure in a way that is not culturally acceptable within their perspective. So sometimes you have to fight that stuff. And then other times, you know, we were missing data from our data set because our units were located in an area of the world that was politically unstable. I mean, one of the examples that comes clearly to my mind is some units that we had in the Republic of Chad. Now Chad is located in the central part of Africa, really uh, unstable, all kinds of uh, civil wars and, and rebels fighting the government. And so sometimes you don't get data because people are more interested in personal security than in feeding your mathematical model. So there's a myriad of reasons why you might be missing data, okay? It's not just because, you know, people are not trying to help out. It's just, sometimes it's just they've got other priorities in mind. They're completely understandable. But not having that data for your model, well, that produces a different type of model that may be giving you uh, results that could lead to conclusions that uh, won't lead you in the best direction for whatever uh, whatever it is you're trying to do. Sometimes when you're actually doing a study and asking people questions, they just drop out for reasons that are related to the study. Okay, so for example, if you're doing a survey of people with low incomes and you're asking them how much money they make, well, they're less likely to report that. Okay, um, you know, there's a certain stigma around poverty and people don't want to be associated with that. So they may... They may drop out, and so you'll be missing data from these people, and that's going to affect the conclusions that you make from your study. Other times, you get people who drop out for reasons unrelated to the study. Okay, The U.S. Census is a good example. It suffers from missing people every 10 years. Typically, these are people who are homeless or have low income. Uh, and that's because census takers typically don't visit the homeless because one of the things you need to fill out when you're filling out the census form is an address. Homeless people don't have addresses. Uh, and people who have low income, well, you know, a lot of them aren't actually home because they're out working, trying to make ends meet so that they can, you know, have a roof over their head. Of course, there are people who are at home because they're on welfare and you're going to get those people, but the people who have low income because they're, you know, they're trying to work two or three minimum wage jobs, trying to keep their head up, they're, they're never going to be home for you to ask them questions. So every 10 years that the census is taken, the results are always suffering from missing data. How you word the question makes a big deal in what kind of results you're going to get. So look at this example here. So Here's a survey that's asking the question, should the president have the line item veto to eliminate waste? 
And when asked with that wording, this question uh, results in 97% of respondents answering yes. However, if you change the question without that leading judgment about eliminating waste and simply ask, should the president have the line item veto or not? So there's no judgment or bias planted into the question itself. Notice the drop in the response rate for those who answer yes. It goes down to 57%. That's a huge jump from 97 to 57%. So just because somebody has a survey out that says, well, this percentage of people says that we should support this agenda. Well, okay, let's have a discussion about how you took the survey. Were you asking the questions in such a way that it biased the results? Because you can totally introduce that just by the way you word the question. The way you order the questions can also influence the results. So here we have a survey question that asks about contributions to air pollution. And so the question is asking, does traffic contribute more or less to air pollution than industry? Well, depending upon which of those two items, traffic or industry, you put first, you get completely different responses. Okay. So if you say, that traffic contributes uh, more to the air pollution than industry, okay, then you actually get 45% of respondents saying traffic. But if you say, if you ask, does traffic contribute less to air pollution than industry, okay, then 27% of respondents say the industry. So the order of the items being considered is a huge, huge, huge deal. Now, if you reverse the items, now if we reverse the order and say, okay, we're going to say, you know, does industry contribute more or less to air pollution than traffic? Then what we get is 57% of respondents saying traffic and 24% of respondents saying industry. Now, you might argue that 24%, 27% is a guy in the same ballpark, not a whole lot of difference there. And I would buy that argument. But come on, 45%, 57%, there's, there's more of a significant difference there. So the order in which you, may, you ask the question, it's going to make a difference in the results that you get. Again, as mentioned before, sometimes people simply don't respond. Okay, Non-response is a huge issue when you're trying to take a sample of a population because people who don't want to talk to you represent a portion of the population. I know whenever I find those online surveys when I visit a website, it's like I always click no. Because I didn't go there to, to participate in some survey. I went there for the website. I want to do whatever it is I want to do on the website. So, and I always turn that down. Well, there's a lot of people like me out there and they're doing the same thing. This is why voluntary response that's a poor sampling method because at least it will bias in your in your sample. And so the sample that you get is not as representative of the population as you really need it to be. So there are those who are more inclined to participate. But again, that's not the whole of the population that you're trying to survey in most cases. So you want to try to avoid non-response whenever you can. And the way you do that is through your sampling method. The use of precise numbers, okay? People get confused between the concepts of accuracy and precision. These are related concepts, but they're not really the same. Precision is referring to the closeness of multiple similar measurements. So if you've got measurements that you're making of the same thing, and those measurements are close together, that's what we would call a precise measurement. However, an accurate measurement simply talks about the closeness of a single measurement to a given standard. Precise numbers may only be estimates, and if that's the case, then it should be acknowledged as such. Let's look at an example that helps us to illustrate the difference between accuracy and precision. And that's where the rifle range comes in. So we've got a target, and it's down, it's down the way, and we're shooting at it, and we're trying to hit the center. So the center of the target is our standard. We can have shots that are really close together, as you see here on this target. So they're precise because they're close together. 
But because they're some distance away from the standard, which is the center, we would say that it's not accurate. Here in this next target, we've got these points here, so the shots are not close together, therefore we do not have precision. However, they're somewhat close to the standard, so we could say that they're accurate. Here's an example where we have neither precision nor accuracy. So they're not precise because they're spread out far apart from each other, and they're not accurate because for the most for most of them, they're not actually near that center target. Look at these shots that are way out here. So in this case, we have neither precision nor accuracy. Finally, here's a case where we do have precision and accuracy. All of the measurements are clustered together, that's precision, and the measurements are close to the standard of the center of the target, that's accuracy. Percentages are often misused in the realm of statistics. So people can use percentages to mislead people or create confusion that advances a certain agenda. You see this all the time in advertising. For example, Continental Airlines once ran an ad about lost baggage and the ad claimed, quote, we've already improved 100% in the last six months. What is this that supposed to mean? You, you, what does that mean? You made no mistakes in the last six months? Uh, and improved what exactly? I mean, you improved 100% in what? Does that mean nobody lost their bag in the last six months? Uh, does that mean uh, that, you know, you didn't make any mistakes? In I mean, what exactly does, you know, you improved what? What was it that improved in the last six months? There's a lot of... There's a lot of uh, confusion here, and that 100% figure is just, in a way, very misleading because we don't know exactly what it, what it applies to. But it's giving you the insinuation that, oh, yeah, we've, we've righted our ship. We've got everything the way that it should be, you know, and it's we have no idea if that's actually the case. So let's go and review the, the potential pitfalls that we've already looked at here in this video. So the first one, misleading conclusions. Okay, Just because two variables exist together, it does not mean one causes the other. Just because statistics say that there's a correlation or some association between two variables, that doesn't mean one causes the other. Correlation is not causation. We want to make sure that our sample sizes are sufficiently large so that the samples we have are characteristic enough of the population that we can make conclusions about the population from our sample. We want to make sure that we avoid missing data as much as possible because you can make a model that tells you anything you want to hear. All you have to do is take out the right data and you get a model that supports a predetermined conclusion. Loaded questions, the order of questions, non-response. This all goes back to how you write and organize your survey. It does matter. It's worth putting thought into. Understanding the difference between precision and accuracy. Because yes, they are different animals. Okay, now they're related. So it's like they both belong to the cat family. But one is a lion and one is a tiger. They are very different animals. So precision, remember, is how close the measurements are to each other. Accuracy is how close measurements are to a given standard, like the center of a target. And percentages can also be used inappropriately. So now we're going to play a game called What is Wrong? In this game, I'm going to present you with an example from a statistical study. I'm going to give you a few seconds to determine what's wrong with the study, and then we'll discuss the correct answer. So don't just sit back and be passive about this. Be active. Be engaged. Okay. Spend the pause time that I'm giving you thinking about what the answer is and answering the question. And I'll go ahead and discuss what the answer is. And in that discussion, if you get the wrong answer, take the feedback that I'm giving you in that discussion to put in your head and say, okay, this is what the right answer is. Fill the knowledge gap. Take advantage of this. Be an active learner. We'll start with an example to illustrate how this game works. So the Idaho Potato Commission polled a thousand adults about their favorite vegetable. The number one choice is potatoes, entered by 26% of those surveyed. 
So the question is, what is wrong here? I'll give you a few seconds. What's wrong here is that the study results heavily match the interests of the organization sponsoring the study. I mean, okay, you're paying for a study that produces a result that's actually favorable to an agenda that you would have. I mean, of course, the Idaho Potato Commission wants people to eat more potatoes. And so they're happy to support a study that comes out and says, yep, potatoes are people's favorite vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, you know what? If you talk to some people, they say the potatoes aren't vegetables at all. Okay? I mean, they actually say, it's not a vegetable, it's a tuber. Well, <laughs> okay, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I just sit back and laugh at some of this stuff. But th the point remains that if the study is producing results, okay, that actually match the agenda of who's ever paying for the study, then... Yeah, there's there's a potential for bias there in that study, and you, and you won't you don't want to just accept it point blank. You you want to ask some questions about the study and how it was conducted before you accept its conclusions. So that's the way I play the game. I give you I give you an example. I'll give you a few seconds to think about. Okay, what what would the uh, answer be to this question? What is wrong? And then we'll go over and discuss the the answers together. So pay attention, participate. Here we go with our first example. Okay, it's about an online poll that was conducted with respect to college majors, conducted by USA Today. Of 728 internet users who chose to respond to this online poll, 41% of them said that their major in college prepared them very well for their chosen career. So what is wrong here? I'll give you a few seconds. Okay, well, here we see a study that's using a voluntary sample. Remember we talked earlier about voluntary response? This is an example of voluntary response. It's an online poll, and there's 720 Internet users who chose to respond. So they weren't randomly selected. It was just whoever's visiting the website and decided to participate in the poll. So these results have the opportunity for bias they're not likely to be broadly applicable to a wider population because the sample of the 720 people who you responded to this survey collected together those 720 people likely don't have the same characteristics as the entire population and so the results aren't going to be representative of the entire population Here's our next example, talking about cell phones and piracy. In recent years, both the number of cell phones and the number of pirate raids at sea have both increased. A statistical study shows a strong correlation between these variables. Therefore, we should stop using cell phones because they produce pirates. And again, I'll give you a few seconds. Okay, I hope you were actually thinking about answering the question and not looking and daydreaming at Johnny Depp. Okay, I know I know that can be hard for some of you, but seriously, okay, you got to be involved in what's going on with the lecture. So here in this study, you've got two variables, and the statistics are saying that there's some there's a strong correlation between the variables. So there's some association there, but that doesn't mean that one variable causes the other. Again, correlation is not causation. Okay. Now, take it on its face. You can look at this and say, okay, the idea that we should stop using cell phones because they produce pirates is absolutely ludicrous. But I can't tell you how many studies are conducted where they show an association between two variables and then they draw this type of ridiculous nonsense. And it doesn't look on the surface like it does here that the conclusion is absolutely ridiculous. So just because it doesn't look ridiculous, that doesn't mean that it isn't, okay? Sometimes the conclusions we draw are ridiculous, okay? Of course, you know, uh, 
you know, stop using cell phones because they produce pirates. Well, you know, if the pirates look like Johnny Depp, then people are going to be using their cell phone a whole lot. But that's the story for a different time. Let's go to our next example. Storks and babies. A statistical study conducted in the years after World War II found a strong correlation between the number of human births and the size of the stork population. Therefore, we can conclude that storks cause babies. What's wrong here? I'll give you a few seconds. Okay, here we got another case where correlation is not causation. Just because you've got two variables that are existing together and the statistics say that there's some association between those variables, it doesn't mean that one variable is causing the other. Correlation is not causation. This, by the way, is, is actually, uh, there actually was a statistical study about this after World War II, and this is where the old idea of storks bringing your baby comes from, from the statistical study that was actually produced. It ran wild in the public, and of course, it's absolutely ridiculous, but again, you know, <laughs> this is kind of things that happens when you don't have the critical thinking skills that people who understand sound statistical methodology have. Here's another example of involved falsifying data. So there was a cancer researcher once criticized for this, and among his data were these figures obtained from six groups of mice. So you see the numbers there, 53%. 58%, 63%, 46%, 47%. Now, each of these groups had 20 individual mice. The question is, what is wrong here? I'll give you a few seconds. So one of the things that we see with this particular report is that you can't obtain these numbers if each group has only 20 individual mice. Okay, here's some actual calculations I'm showing here in the center of the screen. Okay, so let's say, you know, you're looking at this first number, 53%. Okay, well, 53%, probably saying that, you know, 53% responded favorably to some treatment. Well, how do you get that 53% number? Because, see, here if I've got nine mice out of the 20, because there's 20 in the group, so if nine out of the 20 are responding to the treatment, nine divided by 20 is 45%. If I add one more mouse, I get 10 out of 20. That's 50%. If I add one more mouse, I get 11 mice out of 20. 11 divided by 20 is 55%. So... Where does the 53% come from? The only way you can get 53% from this data here is if you're looking at a partial mouse. So it's like, what, 10 and a half mice responded favorably? I mean, that's ridiculous. And you see the same things happening with each of the different numbers that are reported. If you have a group of 20 units, all of your percentages must end in either 0 or 5 because that's the way the math works out. So make sure that you know you vote you don't that you definitely don't want to falsify data because you know you can go too far and someone who's actually like using a little bit of critical thinking skills can look at this and say, oh well, you know, this actually doesn't make sense, and here's why. The math won't let you do it. As I said before, percentages are often misused uh, in the media. Here's an example of that. The New York Times Magazine once reported about the decline of Western investment in Kenya with this statement, quote, After years of daily flights, Lufthansa and, I'm probably mispronouncing that, but yeah, you get it, Lufthansa and Air France, Air France, let's, let's say it right, Air France, had halted passenger service. Foreign investment fell 500% during the 1990s. So what is wrong here? I'll give you a few seconds. Okay, well, here we're looking at a, dec a, a decrease of more than 100%, which is absolutely ridiculous. 
If foreign investment fell 500%, well, if foreign investment falls 100%, you've lost everything. Everything, by definition, is 100%. So if you lose 100%, you've lost everything. How can you lose more than everything? What? So the foreign investment fell 500% means they lost everything, and now they got to pay back four times what they had before? That's, that's ludicrous. You simply lose your money, and that's the end of the game. So anytime you're looking at a decrease uh, or an improvement, okay, you can't, as, a, as an improvement, you can't have more than 100%, okay? Because more than 100% decrease means you're eliminating more than everything that's there, and that's impossible. Here's another example from a public opinion survey conducted by the Newport Chronicle asking its readers to call with response to this question, quote, do you support the development of atomic weapons that could kill millions of innocent people, unquote. 20 readers uh, responded, 87% said no, and 13% said yes. So what is wrong here? I'll give you a few seconds. Okay, here in this instance, there's actually more than one thing wrong. So let's see if the answer you came up with is one of these wrong things. One thing we notice is that the wording of the question is obviously biased. I mean, do you, do you support the development of atomic weapons? And here's the judgment part that's, that's imposed into the question. That could kill millions of innocent people. Now, of course, atomic weapons can kill millions of innocent people. But by putting that into the question... You're introducing a bias that makes the question subjective, and it's leaning the respondents toward a particular response. I mean, 87% said no. I mean, who wants to be responsible for killing millions of people? Most of us don't want that. So the wording of the question is introducing a bias that encourages a negative response. Another thing we see wrong is the sample size is way too small. I mean, you've got 20 people? Seriously? I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, it's ridiculously small. Come on, you, you got to get some more people involved before you can make conclusions that are representative of the entire population. The sample is also self-selected. I mean, you're conducting a survey by asking your readers to call with their response? Well, first of all, Who's going to do that? <laughs> Seriously, in this day and age, who's going to who's going to respond by actually picking up their phone, dialing a number, you know, and talking to somebody? Now, if you text the answer in, eh, you might get some more response from that. But but even still, I mean, the sample is self-selected. Okay, so it, it a much better design for getting your sample would be to randomly select the respondents and let if instead of letting people decide whether or not they want to participate. You look at the population and you randomly select members of the population and then you approach them to say, hey, you know, let's let's uh, let, let's participate in a survey here. We also see that the results cannot come from a sample size of 20, just as we saw before with the cancer researcher falsifying his data about mice that he was experimenting with. I mean, your sample size is 20. So that means that all of your percentages have to end in 0 or 5. So how do we get 87%? Where's 13% come from? I mean, those numbers don't end in 0 or 5. So there's something not quite right with what's going on with their math. Before we wrap up, I want to make sure that we understand how to calculate percentages because percentages are really important in statistics. Okay, so let's make sure we know how to calculate them correctly. To calculate a percentage, there's a part and there's the whole. Okay, so the percent is the portion of the whole that we're trying to represent with the percentage. So you take that part, you divide by the whole, and then you multiply the quote that quotient that comes out with the number 100, or you could just move the decimal point two spaces to the right, and then that gives you a percentage. So here's an example to illustrate. If you have three red balls in a bag of six, and you're asked to find the percentage of red balls, okay, 
you want to take the part and divide by the whole. So the part are the three red balls. That's the portion of the whole that is red. The whole is all the balls together. So that's six balls total. Three divided by six. You punch that out on your calculator, you're going to get 0.5. So if you just move the decimal place two places to the right, so if I just move this decimal place one, two places to the right, I get 50%. I can achieve the same thing by taking 0.5 and multiplying by 100. That'll give me my 50, okay? 50% 50 of the balls in the bag are red. Now, if I have the part, okay, if I wanna, if I wanna figure out what the part is and I have the percentage, I can just work this backwards okay to get the actual part but I have to remember to use the percentage in decimal form so I can actually rearrange this equation right here okay multiply both sides by the whole so that gives me percentage times the whole on this side and then on the other side you have just the part because the whole divided by whole cancels out and so you lost all your holes <laughs> no puns intended. And then <laughs> and then you got part equals the whole times the percentage. So if I want to know what the part of the bag, I know 50% of the balls are red. I don't know that three of them are red, but let's just say we're working backwards. So 50% of them are red, but there's six in the in the total. So then I take six, which is the whole. Then then the 50%. Remember, I have to use this in decimal form. That's the that's the part you have to keep in mind. Otherwise, it just it'll give you a number that's like, woo, yeah, where'd that come from? So six times 0.5 gives us three, and that gives us the total number of red balls that were actually in the bag. Let's go through an example to work together to make sure that we understand how this is how this is working out. So <clears throat> Here we have in this example a Harris poll of 2,302 adults reporting that 14% of them have a tattoo. The question is, what is the exact value that is 14% of 2,302? I'll give you a few seconds to calculate that out. And it's okay, I'm not expecting you to do this in your head. If you can do this in your head, then you are a nerd, okay? And, and you need to just, you know... <laughs> Take your calculator and go back to your nerdery. Okay, we want we want to talk about like math for real people. Okay, real people are not afraid to use their calculator. So go ahead, use your calculator. That's what it's there for. What is the exact value that is 14% of 2,302? I'll, I'll give you a minute to punch that out. Actually, it won't be a minute. It'll be like a few seconds because it shouldn't take it shouldn't take a, it shouldn't take you that long. Go ahead and do that now. Okay, I see some of you are not reaching for your calculator. This is the part where you reach out. I know it's hard, but you got to, you know, it'll exercise, you know, the physical muscles. So you can exercise the mental muscle. Okay, 14% of 2,302. Punch it on your calculator. What'd you get? I'll give you a second. Okay, so when you punch that out, you should get 322.28. Okay, remember, okay, you've got to put this in decimal form. So 14% becomes 0.14. I just took that decimal point and moved it two places to the left to get it in decimal form. And then I just multiply those two numbers together. So 2,302 times 0.14 equals 322.28. That's the exact value. Now, could this result be the actual number of adults who said they had a tattoo? And why or why not? I'll give you a few seconds to come up with your answer. Okay, well, we're not going to get... 322.28 people having a tattoo because guess what? You're counting whole people. Okay, so people count as whole numbers and 322.28 is not a whole number. So if you're counting people, remember, you can't count partial people. I know you hear this stuff about 
Like the average number of kids in a family is 1.2 or whatever the number is. And it's not a whole number. Okay, you're talking about an average. It's a different thing. Here we're talking about an exact count. Okay, so you're not going to count partial people. Well, I didn't like your tattoo as much. We're only counting you as half a person. I mean, none of that business. Okay, you count people as whole people. So 322.28, not a whole number. Therefore, it can't be the actual number of people who have it. Well, then that begs the question, what is the actual number of adults who said they had a tattoo? And yes, I'm giving you a few seconds to come up with your answer. So here it would be 322. And the way you get that is you look at the exact answer, and then you just round it. So here, since it's 0.28, that's less than 0.5. So therefore, we'd round down to 322. Final question here. Among the 2,302 respondents, 46 said they had face piercings only. Now, what percentage of respondents had face piercings only? I'll, again, I'll give you a few seconds. Go ahead and punch that out on your calculator. So here you're going to take 46 and divide it by 2,302. So again, we're looking for a percentage. So you take the part and you're going to divide by the whole. So 46 divided by 2,302 gives us this number here, 0 0.01998. And the decimal point keeps going on. But that's approximately 0 0.02, which when we move the decimal point over is one, two places. So that gives us... 2%. Now, you understand that when you're working your homework, you know, these Pearson products are really particular about how you put the answer in. So make sure you look at how many decimal points they're asking for and respond to that accordingly because you could you could do the calculation right and still get the wrong answer just because you put the answer in wrong. And yes, you know what? You're not the only one frustrated with that. I am frustrated with that. I wish I could just, you know, find whoever's responsible for that and say, hey, check it out. Here's my two by four. I think you two should meet. <laughs> and give them a good wallop upside the head or something because I just get frustrated with some of this sometimes. But, you know, that's the way that is. Let's go through one more example just to make sure that we understand how to do this. So another Harris poll, this time of 2,513 adults, reports that 76% prefer $1 to be in the form of paper currency. And yes, I am in that 76%. I hate coins, especially the dollar coins. Anything, I mean, even like, well, even the coins that are less than a dollar. I mean, quarters I can live with. I can live with quarters. but Dimes, nickels, and pennies. Oh, especially pennies. Oh, I hate them. So, yeah, I'm definitely in that 76%. If you're not in the 76%, if you actually like coins, then, yeah, I'm. there's no judgment here. Okay, we could still get along in class. I'm going to feel sorry for you. I really am. But, you know, we'll still get along. There's no judgment on my part. So, there it is. Uh, that's the example we're looking at. First question, what is the exact value that is 76% of 2,513. And yes, if you haven't noticed by now, I'm giving you a moment to punch that out in your calculator. So go ahead and punch it out. Okay, so the number you get out should be 1909.88. And you get that by just taking 2513 and you multiply by 0.76. Remember you have to use the decimal form. Put the decimal place two places to the left. That turns it into a decimal. Then you multiply it out and that gives you the exact value, which in this case is 1909.88. Now, could we take this result as the actual number of adults who prefer paper currency? 
and then why or why not? I'll give you a few seconds to give your answer. Okay, well, I hope you learned from the last example. No, you can't have a partial person because when you're counting people, you're counting whole numbers. So we don't have a whole number here. 1,909.88 is not a whole number. Therefore, we can't actually, this is not the, the number of people who actually said they preferred paper currency. Of course, the next question is going to be, what is that actual number? I'll give you a few seconds to determine that. Okay, so again, you're going to round the answer. Now, because, you know, 0 0.8, 0 0.88, okay, that's greater than 0.5, so you're going to round up. And so the answer is going to be 1910. Of course, remember, if you have 0.5 exactly, you're going to round up. There's an actual standard that we used uh, back in my uh, <laughs> working in industry as an engineer days um, from the American Society of Testing Materials that basically gave out this huge procedure for how to handle what do you which way do you round because some if you're always rounding up then that's biasing that direction so we have to come up with this huge procedure that lets you know when you round down when you have 0.5 it's just absolutely ridiculous and just completely adding to our workload unnecessarily i'm like i i don't really think that um is there a bias by always rounding up when you have 0.5 yes is it that big of a deal? I don't think it is. Okay, again, it's the difference between statistically significant and practically significant. And, uh, you know, what I've seen to date, I, I'm not convinced that there's any practical significance in that. But that's a conversation for a later time. So, yes, you're going to round up or down, depending upon what number you get. Final question. Among the 2,513 respondents, 327 said they prefer $1 in a coin. So what percentage of respondents does this represent? I'll give you a few seconds. Okay, here, you remember, you want to take the part. That's the 327 divided by the whole. That's 2,513. When you divide that out, you get 0 0.13012, and the decimal keeps going on and on. But we're just going to say that's approximately equal to 0.13, and then that's equal to 13%. So I just move that decimal point over two places, and that gives me the 13% that I use for my answer. All right, that's all we have for this lecture. We've reached the end. Thank you for watching. I will see you in the next video or in the next class, whichever comes first. Thanks again for watching.